welcome. Welcome. Welcome to First Parish Unitarian Universalists of Arlington. We choose. We choose. We choose to be. A liberal religious community. Welcoming. Welcoming. Welcoming to all. We encourage each other on our spiritual journeys. Support one another through the changes in our lives and challenge the excesses and injustices of our time. Called to love, to love, to love, and upheld by joy. We live our faith. It is a story from long ago. 2,000 years ago, a man named Jesus taught of love, healed the sick, ate with the poor, and welcomed the stranger. After he died, those who loved him said that he rose from the dead. Let us rise. It is Ramadan. It is a story of revelation. 1,400 years ago, a man named Muhammad felt embraced by an invisible presence, who then stamped upon his heart words that would become the Quran. An orphan from Mecca rose up to be a prophet. Let us rise. It is Passover. It is a story from long ago. 3,000 years ago, a people were enslaved in Egypt. A man named Moses spoke truth to power. He said to the Pharaoh, let my people go. At first the Pharaoh would not listen, but the people rose up. Let's rise. It is spring. It is as old as time itself. The earth spins around the sun. It spins at an angle. We do not know why the earth is tilted, but because of that tilt, the spring in spring, the days grow longer. Buds burst on trees, daffodils, crocuses, tulips, and hyacinths rise up from the earth. Let us rise. It is now time in our service where we turn inward. So I invite you to settle your bodies, perhaps stretch and settle your feet on the floor. I invite all of us to take that posture of prayer. Spirit of life and love, in this moment, in this sacred gathering, help us settle into quiet. We have been through highs and lows, the depression of Good Friday, the peak of Easter morning. We have walked through the valley of death, became intimate with despair. It has wrapped itself around us, whether we like it or not, sometimes squeezing us so hard our breath catches and constricts. We have been through highs and lows. We know we will be there again. All of our lives, we travel through seasons, times of illness, of grief, of worry, 
Worry for aging parents. Worry for the trans child we want to protect. Worry about making ends meet. We have walked through the valley of death and we know we will be there again. And yet we also know of Easter morn. We know joy so tender and precious, it feels miraculous. Joy and daffodils blooming in abundance. Joy of upcoming weddings and births. Delight in travel saved for, planned for, finally here. The chance to reconnect with loved ones missed. Holy One, help us to reach out and hold that tender joy. May we train ourselves to find it in unexpected places and in unexpected ways. We live in a world of empire, of destruction, of climate change. Helplessness and hopelessness threaten to pull us into the valleys. Let us not forget Easter morning. In times of grief and loss, may we still be people of Easter. Though my tears may flow, I still want to be an Easter person. Hope arrives. Hope rises. Hope is here. As we settle into silence, as we connect with our breath, may the promise of this day May the miracle of goodness and delight, of rebirth and possibility, surround each of us. Lo, I will tell you a mystery. These are the words of the Apostle Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians. Lo, I will tell you a mystery. A priest, a rabbi, and a minister <laughs> went to Israel, Palestine. I was the minister. The Church of All Nations is in East Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives next to the Garden of Gethsemane. There, Jesus is said to have prayed before his arrest. The location calls for a certain solemnity. But the sign at the entrance to the church made me laugh. The post was intended to discourage long-winded tour guides from entering the sanctuary and disturbing the atmosphere of prayer. When I laughed, the rabbi winked at me, and the priest shook his head with a smile. Thankfully, the interfaith group we were leading did not notice. This is what the sign read. No explanations inside the church. <laughs> No explanations inside the church, but oh, how we try. 
When we describe ourselves as a liberal religious community, we are not talking about contemporary politics. We are talking about a way of viewing religious questions that goes back centuries. A very early story associated with the chalice that we light at the beginning of worship and many meetings dates to the early 1500s. Jan Hus was a priest in Prague. The custom of the time was that when communion was served, it was shared only among the ordained, the priests at the altar. The worship service was entirely in Latin, and the priests faced the cross with their backs to the people. But a priest named Jan Hus, rhymes with goose, that's how you remember these things, and it actually means goose in Czech. Jan Hus turned and faced the people in worship, and he spoke in their native tongue, and he invited everyone to partake in this symbolic meal of bread and wine. He held out a chalice and invited all to come forward. For this practice, Jan Hus was branded a heretic and burned at the stake. By turning to face the people, Jan Hus was saying that the holy is found not only in symbols like the cross and in stories of faith depicted in art at the front of the sanctuary, but the holy can be found in the people and in the here and now. And by speaking in the people's native language, he was saying that we all can engage the questions of faith using our minds, our powers of reason, and we can bring our own personal stories and histories to religious questions. And by inviting all to the table, he was saying that truth and love are available to all people. Herein lies the central ideas of liberal religion, ideas people have lived and died for for centuries. The idea that we are remarkably good and capable and blessed the idea that there is no closed book. Truth is continuously unfolding in our midst and a radical hospitality, a welcoming embrace of all people in all our variety. Today we stand amidst four great stories the story of spring unfolding now in its 20th day, how the tilt of the earth, our spinning just a little off kilter, makes all the seasons and all the changes they bear possible. We stand amidst the story of Ramadan, now in its 18th day, about how an illiterate prophet heard a series of revelations from God that became the basis of the Quran and the second largest and fastest growing faith in our world today. And we stand in the fourth day of Passover, a story in which a people escape bondage through miraculous means, seas part, manna falls from heaven and more. And we stand on this day of Easter, a story of a man who preached and acted with a love so great that it threatened the powers that be. And after he was executed by the Roman Empire, the occupying power, some very strange things happened. Despite the renditions in art, there is no one single event, 
But those who knew him after he died experienced his presence, each in their own way. Very strange indeed. Her white hair looked like it was carefully set each week. She wore little to no makeup and was very thin. To church, she wore suits with matching pencil skirts and jacket, Jackie Kennedy style. She lived alone and worked for more than 48 years as the secretary to the president of a local insurance company. She was very proper, even forbidding, and I can only remember her with her lips pursed. I was 26, the candidate for the ministry of the then Universalist Congregation in Salem, Massachusetts, a city which until then had never had a woman serving in any of its pulpits. The feeling of the group asking me questions, interview style, had been warm until this woman spoke. She had bided her time as the excitement wore down, and then she asked very carefully, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? This was clearly a case of stump the minister. <laughs> I don't remember my exact answer, but I gave it a try, I'm sure. I said something like, I believe Jesus lived, I believe he died, and I believe that something of him miraculously lived and lives on still. And if I was on my game that day, I also spoke about his living a remarkable life, a life of love and resistance, how he was executed by the state and not the Jewish people, and how his death was humiliating to him and to his followers, and that it created a crisis of faith in those who followed him. And by all rights, his followers should have given up the cause as followers of many other prophets and teachers did then and still do now. But something happened to keep his vision, his teachings, and his example alive. To which my woman, who shall remain nameless, and of blessed memory, <laughs> to which she asked in a firm manner, but do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus? Backed up against the wall <laughs> in a job interview, I said, well, um, no. <laughs> and today, Years later, I regret my reply. Are you surprised? The preacher says, stay tuned. We live in a time marked by uncertainty. A global pandemic heightened our sense that anything can happen. And all that we assume can change the very course of our days. Political divisiveness, too, has led to unprecedented events. A former president is indicted, the Capitol stormed, an election questioned. Truths we once thought unshakable are no longer quite so reliable. And it can seem our world has become preposterous, as preposterous as revelations of old, as miracles 
and revelations and resurrections. Here is the fundamental question. Amidst uncertainty, how can we live a good life? Knowing that we are mortal, that our days will come to an end, knowing that we are both amazing and limited, how might we lead a good life, a life enlivened by joy and community and meaning that brings us a sense of worth and meaning and strengthens us. How? I invite you to consider the hummingbird. This happens to be glass. It's not a real hummingbird, but it is life-sized and it hangs in Charlie's and my home. Now, the European explorers in the Americas called them, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, joyous voladores, flying jewels. They had never seen such creatures, for hummingbirds came into the world only in the Americas. Nowhere else in the universe are there hummingbirds. 300 species of them, wearing and zooming and nectaring. A hummingbird's heart beats 10 times a second. A hummingbird's heart is the size of a pencil eraser. That's a lot of hummingbird. Each hummingbird visits a thousand flowers a day. They can dive at 60 miles an hour. They can fly backwards. They can fly more than 500 miles without pausing to rest. Each thunderous wild heart the size of an infant's fingernail. Each mad heart. What are you feeling as you hear me offer this science lesson? Hummingbirds, like all flying birds, but more so, have incredible, enormous, <sighs> immense, ferocious metabolisms. To drive those metabolisms, they have these race car hearts that can eat oxygen at an eye-popping rate. And their hearts are built of thinner, leaner fibers than ours. Their hearts are stripped to the skin for the war against gravity and inertia. The mad search for food, and that insane idea of flight. Every creature on Earth, every creature on Earth, has approximately two billion heartbeats to spend in a lifetime. You can spend them slowly, like a tortoise, and live to be 200 years old. Or you can spend them fast, like a hummingbird, and live to be two years old. I ask again, what are you feeling as I tell you this tale of the hummingbird? Might it be wonder or awe? The biggest heart in the world is inside the blue whale and that heart weighs more than seven tons. It is as big as a room. It is a room with four chambers. A child could walk around in it, head high, bending only to step through the valves. The valves are as big as the swinging doors 
in a saloon. The house of the heart drives a creature a hundred feet long. And when this creature, the blue whale, is born, it is 20 feet long and weighs four tons. It's way bigger than your car. And it drinks a hundred gallons of milk from its mama every day and gains 200 pounds a day. <laughs> there are perhaps 10,000 blue whales in the world living in every ocean on the earth. We know this, the animals with the largest hearts in the world generally travel in pairs and their penetrating moaning cries, their piercing yearning tongue can be heard underwater for miles and miles. Mammals and birds have hearts with four chambers. Reptiles and turtles have hearts with three chambers. Fish have hearts with two chambers. Insects and mollusks and worms have hearts with one chamber. Unicellular bacteria have no hearts at all, but even they have fluid eternally in motion washing from one side of the cell to the other, swirling and whirling. No living being is without interior liquid motion. We are all churning inside. Now I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm going to stop this biology lesson and ask again, what do you feel? Perhaps wonder, perhaps awe. How can you and I best live with the uncertainties of life? The answer comes from scientists and poets from prophets and researchers. And the answer is awe. Awe. Awe is that feeling of being in the presence of something wondrous that transcends our understanding. And what difference does experiencing awe do? There's lots of research. Hence, the hours in sermon preparation that I will boil down to just a few nuggets, but Google it if you're more interested. <laughs> what can experiencing awe do? Most of us have a critical voice in our head, telling us we're not smart or beautiful or rich enough. The experience of awe quiets this self-talk. The Buddhist Sharon Salzberg says, awe is the absence of self-preoccupation. But there is more. Experiencing awe, studies show, brings about greater physical health, lower stress, and lower levels of inflammation. Awe activates the vagal nerve, slowing our heart rate. Remember the whales? Remember the hummingbird? Deepening our breathing, triggering the release of oxytocin, which promotes trust and faith and a sense of well-being. In studies, researchers induced awe by showing clips of the earth, panoramic views, think the science museum. And after viewing that, people afterwards were more likely to help others, donate money to charity, and volunteer time for strangers. 
And children who experience awe perform better in school. Pretty good, huh? Awe reminds us that we are not at the center of the world. It is humbling and liberating all at the same time. Feeling awe, we place the stresses of our day into a larger context. And here's the thing, just a couple of minutes of awe a day will do. Just a couple minutes of awe a day. Now, how do we get, how do we get us some awe? <laughs> Experiences of awe need not be rarefied, reserved for when we have enough wealth to enjoy lives of taste and culture, when we have enough time. In one study, prisoners at San Quentin were asked, what gives you awe? Here are some of their answers. My daughter, visitors from the outside, singing with the church band, the air, my celly, that is cellmate, the light moving outside on the yard, reading the Quran, learning how to read today. The awe of a prisoner. For myself, I count looking up at the stars, walking beneath a forest of tall trees, watching the tide come in. And when I let myself, wandering the stacks of a library and just letting my eye and my hand pick a title that interests me. Why? I don't know, but I let myself enjoy. We, you and I, can find awe in simple, unfettered, slowed down acts of looking. Slowed down acts of looking. Up at the clouds, at the sky, in listening to the natural world, the wind, gazing out across the vastness of the ocean, protesting at a political rally, watching a favorite sports team live, listening to a piece of music. Just five minutes of awe a day. What it often calls for, by the way, is novelty choosing the unfamiliar path. Pick a walk, a restaurant, where you get your coffee. Take a different route to work. Check out some music you're unfamiliar with. Chances are you will marvel. Take this as another invitation from one of these research studies, walk out the door. And once you step outside, pick a random number between one and 100. Take that number of steps and look beneath your feet. Then look and find something inspiring right there. 49 steps, try it. From the book of Proverbs, praiseworthy is the person who is filled with awe. Cultivate awe this day.
Mary Oliver writes, truly we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment, and bow their heads. I think of my prim, white-haired, older woman, and I regret my answer to her question, do you believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus? I wish I had said, I don't know. I wish I had asked her story. Why was that important to her? Next time, I hope to practice greater comfort with the uncertainties of faith. I hope to practice a greater appreciation of mystery, and if pressed, to simply say, I don't know. The sign read, no explanations in the church. It made me laugh because it is so antithetical to our liberal religious values. And yet, maybe there is a deeper truth. Enter the space of sanctuary, knowing not the answer to all things. Feel the awe of the ages, of the pain of all our Gethsemanes, and the joy of all our resurrections. And remember, the hummingbird. It is Easter. It is Passover. It is Ramadan. Embrace the mysterious wonder of life and receive new strength. Our meal is about to begin. So many of the stories of Jesus involve meals, and the Passover tradition is itself a meal. And Ramadan ends each day with a joyous meal after the fast. There is a wonder around the tables we each set full of possibility, of connection, of welcome, of sustenance, and of delight.